humanity. Humanity never changes. When the end came, it wasn't what anyone expected. It came suddenly, an explosive psychedelic cataclysm that enveloped the world and hung in the sky, like a doom heralding the directors of the apocalypse. The mass psychosis that followed quickly caused social upheaval and governmental collapse as man-made systems imploded. The few that survived suffered through horrendous wars, disastrous weather and ecological catastrophe. In this physically and mentally scarred landscape rose a new breed. Those who refused to die shared a new equality. They were all in a wasted world. But humanity? Humanity never changes. Hi everyone, DM Scotty's new Easy 6 book, Wasted World, just dropped, and boy have I been looking forward to talking about it. Now, this is not going to be a straight up review. Most of my experience of this game has been in a playtest campaign run by DM Scotty, and the man could run an engaging game using only paper, scissors, stone as a rule set. And there is a tiny bit of my own feedback in the book, so that's bound to color my opinion. Also, in the interest of transparency, he did give me a free PDF rulebook. So what I'm going to do today is just go over what's in the book, with some commentary. I am going to assume some knowledge of the EZD6 system, but hopefully everything should be straightforward enough. First off, Wasted World is a post-apocalyptic setting. 30 or 40 years from our current time, a psychic explosion happens that messes the world up and breaks down society, leaving the survivors to deal with a new world under a demon sky, whose miasma bends the laws of reality. The causes and details of the event are left open, so you can adapt this to any kind of post-apocalyptic world you want to run. Mad Max, Book of Eli, or Fist of the North Star style wastelands? You got it. Hollow style junk towns? Sure thing. Zombie apocalypse? You bet. Scotty loves his movies, and he made sure to pack his book with every reference tip of the hat and not to the genre that he would. The official timeline for the game picks up a couple of centuries after the cataclysm. So life has kind of settled down somewhat into a kind of balance, where some people have banded together to build holes and others roam the ways as raiders or scavengers exploring the ruins of the times before. That said, the system can also be used to run games set during the apocalypse. In fact, my friend Sean over at Full Moon Crafting Studios ran a separate campaign using these rules where a zombie apocalypse was going down in modern day US, and that worked great. But that's enough background. Let's look at the rules, and uh, we'll start off with character generation. In Wasted World, you have 10 survivor paths to pick from. Wasteland Warrior and Hunter are pretty self-explanatory. You can also pick a Machine Head, which is your mechanical engineer. Rambler, essentially your negotiator or bar type. Scavi, or scavenger. Weird, that's basically the Wasteland Wizard. And Jack, which is a more customizable template but similar to the Delver in EZD6 Core. Apart from these human pots, you can also pick Android, Clone or Mutant, who get different abilities and have their own inclinations and upgrade options. Let's walk through character creation and rebuild my character from the playtest. I picked an Android and named him Dorian White. He's an android from the before times who has been programmed to recover lost knowledge and help rebuild civilization as part of a doomsday protocol. I figure he looks a bit like Andreas Wilson in the uh, Swedish television show Real Humans. Although technically he plays a cyborg there rather than uh, an android. Potato, potato. Every pot gets one or more automatic pot inclinations, which every character of the type gets. In the case of androids, it's bioclear, which makes them immune to contamination, poison and contagion. We'll get back to what that means later in the video. Each pot also gets a number of inclinations to pick. Androids get 5, and they have access to the Biosynth package list in addition to the standard survivor talents that everyone has access to. We can mix and match these any way we like, as long as we pick at least one survivor talent and at least two Biosynth packages. In my case, I picked two Biosynth packages. The first one was Cerebral Uplink which lets Dorian connect and hack into ancient computers and machines wirelessly. And that's the reason why we have a killer robot named Cletus chilling on the porch of our base, sitting in a rocking chair and wearing a nice straw hat. The second one was Overdrive, which lets him trade in one strike once a day to double his actions for a round. 
Overdrive was an inclination I came up with for this character because I was watching Engineers at the time and the Sand of Sun implant in that show looked cool. My original draft did not have the uh, once per day restriction because I figured that the strike cost would be high enough. However, I hadn't factored in the fact that Wasted World has a lot more options for healing than Easy Score. So Scotty wisely added that in to stop this from becoming a meat grinder. From the survivor talents list, I picked Mysteries of the Fall, which meant that Dorian would be able to identify and understand objects and remnants from the world that was. Now, this was a bit of a double-edged sword. On the plus side, it fit perfectly with the character concept, and normally it would allow a rebel rouser to pass information to the player very efficiently. In our case, because we're based in different parts of the world, it was a bit trickier. Case in point, when we were exploring a ruined shopping mall, TM Scotty told me that I was looking at the remains of a JC Penny store, which meant exactly nothing to me until he and the rest of the party patiently explained what the hell that was. For most game groups, this should not be a problem, but it was kind of funny and it's something you might want to keep in mind if you're playing in an international group. The last two inclinations I picked were Yaki, to help with the fast talking and negotiation, and Marksman, because while it's good to give peace a chance, it's even better to have a backup plan. Next up, we get to pick an edge, which is a pod specific ability. Androids can pick either Defensive Shock, which gives them the ability to stun an attacker once per combat, or Mimic, which lets them replicate voices they have heard. I picked Mimic because it seemed to be more in character, and I thought it would be fun. But it turned out to be incredibly useful in our very first session when we ended up in a night battle with some raiders, and Dorian was able to replicate their leader's voice and confuse them with conflicting orders. Like Easy Six Core, we round off the characters with aspects. These are just descriptors which help flesh them out, and you can either pick them from the list in the book or just make them up for yourself. For Dorian, I settled on Driven, because of his mission, and looks too normal. Because while he does look completely human, he doesn't have any of the marks and scars of someone who's lived in the waste for any amount of time, which makes him look rather unusual. Finally, we take our starting equipment and we're ready to go exploring the wastes. And I guess now is a good time to talk about the changes in the way that equipment works in Wasted World. Unlike Easy Six Core, Pots don't have a built-in armor save, and everyone has a base of 6. Armor is now treated as equipment, so your save changes depending what you have on you. Most Pots start off with uh, Junk Armor, which gives a 5 plus save, and you can find other armor which improves this further. Shields are also available, and the way that they work is they give you an extra save on a 6 once per round. Most Pots can use any armor and shield with only 2 restrictions. Muties cannot wear some types of armor simply because it was not designed for their frame. And weirds can wear armor, but it will severely interfere with some of their powers. Now, muties can use some armor, but uh, weirds will usually have to run around an armored, so if you play one, you will definitely need to rely on your teammates to keep you out of harm's way. Apart from the armor, you can also make yourself harder to hit by taking cover. In most cases, it doesn't matter how well armored you are, you don't want to stand out in the open in the middle of a firefight. The other big change in equipment comes with weapon qualities. Most characters start with cobbled weapons, which are what the average wasteland craftsman is able to produce. These weapons aren't terribly reliable and can jam or break in the middle of a fight. The next step up are benchmark weapons, which are either remnants from the before times or the creations of especially skilled craftsmen. These weapons are far more reliable and won't jam or break. The top tier are status weapons, which are all ancient technology that cannot be replicated by the survivors. These weapons give wounds when used, and include some high-tech stuff like lasers and plasma guns. These weapons are few and highly prized, so players should never be able to find them for sale. Speaking of weapons, there is a lot more variety in a Wasted World, ranging from baseball bats to fusion cannons. Most basic weapons do one strike of damage, although some have an increased critical hit chance in some situations. For example, assault rifles crit on a 5+, plus, while shotguns have an increased chance to hit at a short range. It's not all straight up damage either, because you have things like the Newton gun which lets you immobilize targets or throw junk around. Slapping raiders in the face with a broken toilet never gets old, 
although we're into heavy firepower, you're going to love the blast gun. That does 5 strikes of damage per hit. 5. Remember that the average human only has uh, 3 strikes, so you know that's pretty devastating. That said, don't think standard weapons are dangerous because crits are still a thing. So, there was this one time where the party was exploring this uh, ruined research base that was infested with these things that looked like the uh, xenomorphs from aliens. We were pretty beaten up. Dorian had only one strike left and his armor had been melted away when one of the aliens splashed him with acid blood. We'd pieced together what had happened there and uh, torched what uh, looked like eggs when this gigantic mother alien showed up and uh, we decided to retreat. Kate managed to slow it down a little with her shotgun, but it was still on our tail as we bundled into an incredibly slow cargo elevator to the surface. As the elevator chugged along, we started hearing tearing sounds from the shaft below us as the queen climbed up after us. Then a shudder and the sound of whining gears above us as it latched onto the cab and started to chew its way to the floor to get us. Dorian did some high-speed maths, took aim, fired his pistol through the floor, and I rolled a very improbable series of crits. With three points of karma, that was nine strikes of damage, followed by a scream and a satisfying thump of the alien's carcass falling to the ground several floors below us. That was a hell of a session, and a testament to Scotty's skill in running a game. If that had happened in a regular room, it would still have been fun, but the tension built up in this scene made it far more memorable. Still, back to equipment. Unlike Easy 6 Core, where you can lug around a virtually infinite amount of loot, in Wasted World your carry capacity is restricted. This was an important design choice as it forces more choices on the uh, players as to what they can keep with them and what they have to leave behind. And it also encourages players to establish a base where they can uh, keep stuff they want to hold on to. Each player gets 15 slots of equipment, and another 5 if they have a backpack. Most items take one slot, large items like shotguns take two slots, and small items like flashlights or grenades take half a slot. This infantry system changed a lot during playtesting. Initially it was way more complex, and we had to note what was carried in the hand, what was worn on our person, what was in the backpack, and so on. The way this worked was anything carried in your hand was immediately accessible. Anything that was in your pockets or hanging off a harness needed a free action to get to, and anything in your backpack needed a full action or more. Plus, of course, if your backpack got stolen, the stuff in it would be gone. While I really like the system, I have to agree with Scotty that it didn't really have the same vibe as the rest of the rules. So, in the interest of keeping the easy and easy D6, the simpler system was adopted. You can still find a vestige of this in the inclinations, though. The pack rate inclination was originally added to allow uh, faster access to stored items, but it was later changed to provide more inventory slots. Now, part of what makes a post-apocalyptic game uh, tense is scarcity, and I remember playing Fallout when I was younger, and trying to ration the four builds I had in most of the early game. One of the design goals for uh, Wasted World was to create that feeling without resorting to counting every single bullet and uh, can of baked beans you have on you. The way that Wasted World does this is by abstracting consumables into supplies. You can carry a limited amount of these resources, and at the end of each day you start taking them off. You consume one point of supplies per day regardless, because that's your food and water. If you've been in a significant firefight, you take off another point for the ammo you spent. And if you've been using rapid fire weapons like a submachine gun or an assault rifle, that's two points you take off. This system is very elegant, and because there are consequences to lack of food and water, which we'll get into later, you do have to think about uh, how to manage your supplies, but you never really have to do any bookkeeping. Now, let's say that you want to have more stuff than your 20 slots allow. Obviously, you can look into setting up a base and stashing stuff in there. But that won't help you if you're looting a ruin of the ancient world out in the middle of nowhere. What you need is a vehicle, and Wasted World has you covered. Vehicles come in four categories. Light, like motorcycles or buggies. Medium, which are your regular cars. Heavy, like pickups or vans. And super heavy, like semis or buses. Each category has a number of structure points, which work like strikes. 
and its own armor save, with heavier vehicles having more strikes and a better save. Speed is obstructed, so any vehicle can outrun any vehicle that is heavier than it, and ties can be resolved using the Quanta system, which we'll talk about in a bit. The rules cover pretty much everything you could possibly think of for a vehicular clash in the uh, wasteland, like shooting at vehicles, shooting from vehicles, ramming and pulling stunts. There are even rules for modding vehicles, such as uh, welding on more armor, adding flamethrowers, always fun, and cultural dispensers. But be careful not to overload your ride. The way the rules work is in line with the rest of the system, so it doesn't feel like added complexity, but there's a lot of flavor in here that will enrich your game. Now, you've got your character, your gear, and your ride. And you're probably wondering what you can expect to find in the wasteland. Well, pretty much everything. From the relatively benign Kanga Mouse to the terrifying Doom Stomper. Going through all sorts of gangers, zombies, and cultists in between. The denizens of the wasteland section is packed with creatures to throw at your players. And I want to take a second here to appreciate Sean Bova's artwork. It's consistently excellent through the whole book. But I feel that in this section, in particular, he was having a lot of fun illustrating the creatures. That said, the biggest enemy you'll be facing in Wasted World is the environment itself. At the most basic level, if you run out of supplies, you won't be able to heal when you rest, and after 3 days, you start losing strikes, which you can't recover until you find food and water again. If you get desperate, you can risk scavenging for food, but that comes with its own risks, as you can catch some pretty nasty stuff that way. I've heard a lot of people complain that the warden in Easy 6 Core is not very useful, but this is exactly the kind of scenario where they shine, because they can keep the party supplied. The hunter in Wasted World can't do that automatically, but they're still great to have around because their tracking skills and survival skills make it much easier for them to find food. As if that wasn't enough, there's also contamination. Whether it's radiation or the corrupting power of the miasma, if you hang around the contaminated area, you're going to pick up contamination points. In heavily contaminated areas, it might be a question of minutes. Once you pick up enough contamination points, you lose one of your strikes permanently. This is some brutal stuff, so you want to make sure you have protective gear and medication to deal with this, before it gets that far. Originally, the contamination rule wasn't that deadly. It just caused a strike of damage, but during playtesting the idea was bounced around that if you took a strike to contamination, you could just get some healing and then you would walk it off. That felt a little cheap for something this severe, so in the end the permanent strike loss seems threatening enough to properly convey how bad this is. Speaking of miasma, let's talk about words. Words are psychers who can channel the power of the miasma into magic-like effects. One of the complaints I've heard most frequently about is the conjurers is that free for magic is too difficult for people who are used to having a list of spells to uh, pick from. Now, personally, my answer to that is usually don't fucking play a conjurer then. But DM Scotty is far more accommodating, so he worked the solution into uh, Wasted World. By default, weirds do not use the uh, freeform system. Instead, the inclinations from the uh, mental mutation list act as fixed powers. These include stuff like teleportation, telepathy, and a host of other neat mind tricks. However, if you still prefer the freeform systems, weirds do have the Neuroflux Edge, which allows them to use the power of the miasma in the same way as easy 6 conjurers use magic. If anything, they're even more versatile, because unlike conjurers, weirds are not constrained by circles, so you can go total world. Since we're on the subject of coming gripes, character advancement is another thing that comes up fairly often. I'm still convinced that it's totally unnecessary in easy physics, and even more so in Wasted World. Surviving, establishing yourself, and finding cool gear is already very narratively rich, even before you layer in other cool plots. However, there is an advancement system in Wasted World. Each session, players earn one experience point which they can spend to buy advantages like more strikes, more recreations, or power dice which are a new meta currency that you can spend to apply a boon to any skill. There is a limit of 10 advantages per character, so you still need to be a bit selective. My playtest group didn't use the system because none of us felt the need for it, but it's there if you want it. Certainly the other groups who did use it seemed to like it. The design goal around this one was to make sure that the advanced characters are tangibly better, 
but the power gap isn't so great that a new character would be completely out of their depth. Sure, the new isn't going to have any uh, glitzy equipment, but they're not going to feel completely useless either. If you like me and prefer story-based rewards, this book has you covered too. All the awesome stuff the uh, players can find will put them way above the average UA standard. There are also miasma crystals that weirds can use to boost their powers, grafts that can give clones and mutants new abilities, and upgrades that can give androids new skills and tricks, so there's always a little more to add on. In the end though, power-ups are no match for a good story when it comes to keeping players engaged. One thing that the ESD6 core rules were lacking was uh, something to handle the partial completion of extended tasks like uh, picking a lock or handling a chase. This could usually be handled by saying, sure you succeed and it takes you so much time, or you fail, but in general the dice will only give you a yes or no resolution. Wasted World covers this gap by introducing dice pool challenges. Say the player wants to do something that will take some time, let's say they want to pick a lock. The rebel rouser decides how difficult the task will be, from 3 to 6, and draws that many dice. Here the results are 6, 4 and 2. On their turn, the player then rolls one die, plus any extra dice if they have boons or want to use power dice. Here they got two fives, which equal or beat the four and the two. So those dice are removed from the rebel rouser's pool. On the next player turn, they roll again. And since one of the dice matches the six, let's remove two. The rebel rouser pool is now empty, and the task is completed and the lock is open. If on any turn the players fail to remove any dice from the rebel rouser's pool, then the task fails, and something bad happens. Maybe the lockpicks break in the lock, or they trip an alarm system. As usual, unless they're in combat or there are significant consequences to a failure, I would avoid rolling at all. But for those situations, this is a really clean way of doing it. Okay, I've probably talked your ears off by now, so I think I'll leave it at this. There is more to the book, like some uh, neat scenario generator tables, but you got the most important stuff. Now, personally, when it comes to tabletop RPGs, my favorite genre will always be swords and sorcery. And while I'm partial to post-apocalyptic settings, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed playing Wasted World. I'm sure part of this was down to how epic the rebel rousers and the other players were, but the system is sleek, and it helps the story along. And there's tons of material in here for world building and making up new stories. I hope that was useful, and if you're interested, you can find links to Wasted World in the video description below. Those aren't affiliate links, I'm just sharing them because I really like the game. Also below you'll find links to Easy Score and uh, The Four Horsemen, which is my own Easy module and its own kind of apocalypse. And yes, those are affiliate links. Anyhow, I'll hope I'll catch you around soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Bye!